Happy Thanksgiving Eve. It is Wednesday, November 23rd, 2022. We're here tonight to study the book of Genesis at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin. We are in Genesis chapter 25 tonight. So we are uh, roughly halfway through the book of Genesis. So Genesis chapter 25 is where we'll be in just a few moments. You may want to have your Bible ready. That's where we'll be in just a few minutes. I'm very glad that you joined us tonight. I'm uh, happy to have you here. I would also invite you to join us this coming Sunday morning at 9 30 for a Bible class and at 10 30 for worship and as we always say if you have any questions about what you see or hear or what we're studying in class tonight we would invite you to get in touch make a phone call or send a text to the church number which is 608-224-0274 or send an email to fourlakeschurch at gmail.com we would certainly love to hear from you uh, last week I told you that my eight-year-old MacBook computer had died and a week ago I was borrowing my wife's ThinkPad laptop top for this class. So just a quick update in case you may be interested in what's going on in your preacher's life right now. Uh, my son purchased a used ThinkPad for me from Ohio. It came in a day earlier than we expected last Thursday, I believe. And so he's kind of souped it up for me. And this is what I'm using tonight. It's running Linux, which is totally new to me as of about a week ago, and I'm using OpenOffice for tonight's class, which is an open source alternative to PowerPoint. So this is also very new to me. Uh, this has been a, a learning experience for this old guy, and so if uh, class still looks a little bit different than it did a few weeks ago, this may explain it. Uh, if the video of me right now at this moment still isn't what it used to be with the MacBook, we may consider uh, adding a, an external webcam. Uh, the way we do class, though, of course, the video of me shrinks down within a few minutes, and so uh, the video quality isn't much of a factor at that point, except right here at the beginning, and, and so that's where we are. Uh, thankfully, I guess more good news is I didn't lose any data in this transition. I'm very thankful for that, but right now I am kind of retraining these programs to uh, learn strange new words like Exum and Macpila and some of these other terms in the Bible that we've been working through that I've already added to my old spell checker. So I, I got that to do all over again over the next year or so so they don't get flagged by the uh, spell checker. And the other good news is that my son was actually able to remove and replace the swollen batteries in my old MacBook. So I am thankful for that. That involved, I think, copious amounts of Goo Gone. Uh, sprayed on the uh, insides of that old computer and uh, along with some very skillful prying and scraping and so the uh, old MacBook seems to be living to see another day and so it's not toast completely it seems to have been uh, resurrected somewhat but uh, this seems like a good uh, good time to continue the transition to a ThinkPad so it is nice to have options I'm thankful for that uh, other than learning these new programs I'm still looking for a good alternative to Olive Tree the Bible software I've used for many years it's available for Mac and also for Windows but not for Linux and I still have access to the New American Standard Bible in other ways online and a program that's been installed here but uh, those ways are not quite as familiar to me and they take quite a bit more time to reformat so if the text looks a little weird in tonight's class that would be why but that's where we are right now. Tonight we are back to studying the book of Genesis so the book of beginnings written primarily by Moses and we've been studying the life of Abraham over the past several months now and last week in Genesis chapter 24, you may remember Abraham sent his servant to go find a bride for Isaac. And that servant was, of course, successful in completing that mission. He finds Rebekah and brings her back. And then she and Isaac are married at the end of the previous chapter. So that brings us now tonight to Genesis chapter 25. So our first paragraph tonight is Genesis chapter 25. And let's look together at verses 1 through 6. Genesis chapter 5. Uh, Genesis chapter 25 verses 1 through 6. Now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore to him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan and the sons of Dedan were Asherim and Latushim and Lemumim. The sons of Midian were Ephah and Epher and Hanak and Abida and Eldah. All these were the sons of Keturah. Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. In verse 1, we find Abraham gets remarried in his old age to a woman by the name of Keturah, and they have six more children. So um, Abraham kind of has a, a second phase to his life at this point. But the point of this passage, though, I think is to emphasize that Abraham leaves the inheritance 
uh, completely to Isaac. And he gives some gifts to these other children. He, um, you know, parts with some of his belongings while he's still alive. But the inheritance itself goes to Isaac. Isaac, of course, being the child that God had promised. And uh, Isaac will be the focus of the next several chapters in Genesis. And then we also learn here that Abraham sends his other children away to the east. So that I'm assuming... Uh, so there's no conflict over the land, similar to the situation that uh, Abraham and Lot found themselves in. So Isaac then stays in the promised land, but the others are sent away so as perhaps not to, to crowd Isaac out. So let's continue then with uh, Genesis 25 verses 7 through 11. Genesis chapter 25 verses 7 through 11. These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron the son of Zohar the Hittite facing Mamre, in the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with Sarah his wife. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac lived by Beer Laharoi. In this paragraph, we learn that Abraham lives to the age of 175 years. So definitely old enough to be uh, considered a part of the old guy category in those days. But still, if we think about it, a, a much shorter lifespan than those just a few generations earlier. And I think that just reminds us that the lifespans in Genesis are continuing to fall from the 900s down to the mid-100s. And I do love the summary of Abraham's life, that he died in a ripe old age, an old man, and satisfied with life. I mean, if that could be said of any of us, that would be just an awesome thing. But his life was definitely an adventure. I think that'd be very safe to say. Uh, and his life was satisfying. He had a good life. And it, it's a shame, of course, to look back at our lives and to be unsatisfied. That'd be a terrible feeling. Uh, but Abraham, though, he lived by faith. He had experienced some good family moments along the way. And at the end, the Bible here says that he was gathered to his people. And I love that description of death. We don't just cease to exist, uh, but as God's people, we certainly do transition to a reunion of sorts. And I see that kind of as contrast to Judas. Remember after Judas... Uh, betrayed the Lord, and then he took his own life. I think there's that verse maybe early on in Acts where it says that uh, Judas went to his own place. And uh, that is by no means as positive as what we read about Abraham here. Abraham was gathered to his people. Uh, Judas, on the other hand, went to his own place. A, a big difference right there. Um, so death is not the end. I think we get that from this passage. Abraham is still living, um, even to this day. And in fact, Jesus uses Abraham to prove something to the Sadducees who did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. This is over in Matthew 22, 31 and 32. But you may remember that the Sadducees brought this highly complex hypothetical scenario about this, uh, you know, death and remarriage and all this kind of thing. And they were trying to trick Jesus into saying something unpopular, perhaps uh, denying the afterlife in the process. And Jesus replies in this way. He says, But regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. So I want us to notice that Jesus makes an entire argument uh, based on the tense of a verb. And what I mean by that is, God did not say that he was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but that he is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, Abraham is still alive in some form or another. And so that's the argument that Jesus makes. And so we have this reminder here in Genesis 25 that Abraham doesn't just cease to exist, but instead he is gathered to his people. And so he is still in existence in some form or another. In verse 9, we have an interesting reunion here on earth as Abraham's uh, death and at his funeral. Uh, we notice here that uh, Isaac and Ishmael come together. Obviously, uh, funerals can be incredibly sad moments, but I think I've often said that one of the benefits to funerals is that it's one of the only times when some families get together. And so a funeral can be just like a, a huge family reunion. 
And in fact, I think that back to the last time that I've seen a number of my cousins, and it was at the funerals of my grandparents. We just live too far away to get together on a regular basis, and I know it's not ideal, uh, but with us living so far up here, that's just the way it is, and we're really spread out all over the country now. But I think that's what we see here. Um, I doubt Isaac and Ishmael got to hang out with each other too often, but they do come together, they do... Uh, lay aside their conflict and potential differences here to uh, bury their father, at least long enough for that. And we find in this passage that they bury Abraham with Sarah in the cave of Machpelah. And we find in this passage that God continues to bless Isaac after Abraham's death, just as he had blessed Abraham. Well, let's continue tonight with Genesis 25, verses 12 through 18. Genesis chapter 25, verses 12 through 18. Now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael, by their names in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Adbeel, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Massa, Hadad, and Tima, Jeter, Naphish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps. Twelve princes, according to their tribes, these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt. As one goes toward Assyria, he settled in defiance of all his relatives. Starting in verse 12, we have a record of Ishmael's descendants. Obviously, the Bible uh, doesn't focus on this branch of the family, but we do have a summary here. The names are not really too significant to us. They are not; uh, they don't, you know, pop out as being very important in biblical history, at least as far as I'm concerned at this point. But I'm assuming that as Moses write these wor- writes these words, uh, his first readers would have almost certainly recognized some of these people. So as they traveled through the wilderness, as they crossed over the Jordan, as they conquered the land of Canaan. Uh, there certainly would have been a value in learning something about their neighbors. And so Moses gives us a summary here. In verse 17, we find that Ishmael dies at the age of 137. Again, notice the uh, shorter lifespan. And at the end, Moses tells us that Ishmael and his descendants settled in defiance of all their relatives. So the uh, descendants of Ishmael were against the descendants of Isaac. And really, it's eager. It's, uh, it's easy to see why. Uh, Hagar and Ishmael obviously were kicked out of the household by Sarah. And then we have Abraham giving the entire inheritance to Isaac and not to the others. And so we have some serious favoritism going on here. And this favoritism shown to one descendant and not the other is uh, something that will absolutely continue to cause trouble over the coming chapters with uh, uh, generations to come. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 25 verses 19 through 26. Jesus, uh, Genesis 25, verses 19 through 26. Now, these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, to Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body. And one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. Well, thanks to this paragraph, we can fill in our timeline a little bit in terms of ages. Uh, We didn't know it when we studied Genesis 24 last week, but now we learn that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. And here we learn that Rebekah couldn't bear children, so Isaac goes to God on her behalf and Rebekah conceives. We'll see this prayer prayed and answered a number of times in Bible times. And we learn that the children were struggling inside of her. And so now she prays to God and she wants to know why. She wants some answers. 
And God indeed answers her directly with this prophecy in verse 23 that two nations are inside of her and that they will continue to struggle with one being stronger than the other. And then she also learns that the older will serve the younger. And this is obviously not what we might expect as the firstborn in scripture is often given some special benefits. And so uh, something will happen here to upset the natural order. I'm just saying we have a little bit of a preview of it right here, even before these children are born. In the last few verses here, Rebecca then gives birth to twins. And the first is born red and hairy. And so they don't name him Harry, they name him Esau, which is pretty much the same thing. So, uh, and then the second is very close behind and comes out holding on to his brother's heel. And so they name this young man Jacob. And we learn at the end that Isaac is now 60 years old at this point. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 25 verses 27 through 34. Genesis 25 verses 27 through 34. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I am about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, First, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. So in the last paragraph tonight, we fast forward to Jacob and Esau as grown-ups. Esau is an outdoorsman, a hunter, a man of the field. Uh, Jacob, on the other hand, is a peaceful and more refined man hanging out indoors in tents. And this is where we see a division in the family. Isaac, the dad, loves Esau because Esau makes him stuff that he's killed in the field. And dad likes that kind of thing. But Rebecca, the mom, loves Jacob more. And so I think we see that there is definitely a conflict brewing in this family. And the first clash of sorts starts in verse 29. Jacob has cooked some stew. Esau comes in from the field. He's hungry. He wants, uh, notice it, he wants just a swallow of Jacob's stew. And so I uh, kind of minimize there, just a swallow. That's all I need. And, and Jacob wants to make a deal first. Before I give you a swallow of this stew, sell me your birthright. And Esau, in a very short-sighted move, figures he's so hungry that a birthright's not going to do him any good if he's dead, if he starves to death. And so he agrees to that. And he trades the right of being the firstborn for a bowl of stew, and we'll find here some bread as well. So he trades his inheritance then for a single meal. You know, sometimes in the New Testament, our salvation is described as an inheritance, isn't it? You know, we are described as those who will inherit salvation. And there are a few references like that. So obviously we'll come back to this later. This is a much deeper picture, but this is where it begins. And this will be really significant over in chapter 27. Uh, but the actual selling of the birthright, that comes up later. In, uh, actually, in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. So as we close tonight... Let's just look briefly at the New Testament reference, the New Testament application of this chapter that we've studied tonight. So we can't miss this. This is Hebrews chapter 12, and let's just look at verses 14 through 17. Hebrews 12, verses 14 through 17. Pursue peace with all men, and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled. That there be no sexually immoral or godless person like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. As Christians, we are to be at peace with each other. We are to pursue peace. We're not to be overcome with bitterness toward one another, unlike Esau. So that's the application here. And Esau, because of these conditions, because of what was in his heart, he makes an incredibly unwise decision, doesn't he? 
He trades his birthright for a single meal. And that birthright, of course, would give the oldest child the greater blessing. Uh, but Esau traded it in. He cashed it in for one meal. And the warning is we can do the same thing today. Uh, we can trade a solid marriage for a temporary affair. And we may regret that for the rest of our lives, if not for eternity. Uh, we can trade a good name and a good reputation for a brief scandal. And we can regret that for an eternity. And on and on. And I, and I think we would agree sometimes there are decisions that we make in this life where the consequences really cannot be undone. And we may weep over those decisions we've made, but really even weeping is unable to um, undo the harm that we've done by sinning and looking at life in a very short-sighted way. So when we trade what is eternal for what is temporary, sometimes we will regret that decision just as Esau did. And so I guess the uh, application of our study tonight is do not be like Esau. Don't do what this man did, but instead of looking at the immediate future and our gratification here and now, we need to be looking ahead um, at, the, at the life that is to come. Well, this brings us to the end of Genesis 25. Next week, we hope to come back together to look at chapter 26. We'll focus then more on the life of Isaac. And thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see you this coming Lord's Day at 9.30. Uh, we've now finished our part one study of the book of Isaiah. So part two, Lord willing, is coming in the spring. Caleb will get back to teaching at that point in three months. Uh, but for now, we're heading for the book of Ephesians, and uh, Aaron Grodi, one of our elders, he'll be teaching that class starting this coming Sunday. So I would encourage you to take a few moments this week to read the book of Ephesians as we prepare for that study. So that's what's coming next over the next three months, Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. And then after class this Sunday, of course, we plan on coming together at 1030 for the worship assembly. But let's close our study tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, tonight we praise you as being the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And tonight we pray that we would learn from Esau, that we would learn to look beyond our immediate hunger, and that we would learn to look to you as we make decisions, that we would make decisions based on our eternal future and based on the inheritance that you've promised to us. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer tonight. We are so thankful for all of our many blessings. We come to you tonight in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.